Last video in the series, Intercompany Transactions, Topic 4, Elimination Entries for Depreciable Assets. The same underlying principle as non-depreciable assets, such as inventory or land, apply here. Profit cannot be recognized until PP&E is sold to a third party. It must be eliminated in the consolidation of the financial statements. There's an extra step here, as profit cannot be recognized until the PP&E is sold to a third party or consumed. Because remember, with inventory or land, land just sits on your books until you sell it. Inventory is meant to be sold. Um, but under both of those, you don't consume your own inventory and you don't consume your own land. But with depreciable assets, the whole dang purpose of them is to buy something and then use it to generate income over time. So eventually, as you use the asset, it will go down to zero, which is why it is different than inventory or land. This depreciation in the consolidated financial statements must be adjusted to reflect the depreciation on the original cost of the asset to the group, to the parent and the sub. The gain or loss on the intercompany sale is recognized as that asset is used up or depreciated, uh, as well as when it is sold. Depreciation on pp e for the consolidated entity should be recorded on the cost at which the asset was brought into the group, as discussed previously. This is based on the cost of the books of the seller, regardless of whether it is the parent or the sub. Depreciation is already recorded on the separate entity financial statements normally. And then so what we're looking to adjust during the consolidation process, when we smush the two companies together and remove the excess, is our impact is going to be to the net depreciation based on basically what the smushed portion is minus what it should be. So our entry, our elimination entries, uh, are looking to adjust that that overlap, that access, so that we can get a combined consolidated version based on the original cost to the group. So there are two required consolidation entries here. One is uh, to adjust depreciation as noted, and the other one to adjust the holdback or the portion of um, unrealized profit from that gain on sale of the land. It's important to know that the gain on intercompany sales of depreciable assets are, again, going to be realized through either, and sometimes both, the sale of an asset to an outside group or the use of the sale or from use of the asset in recording depreciation. So in a given year, you might be depreciating the asset and then, you know, halfway through or maybe at the end of the year, you might sell it. So in that instance, you would have elimination entries uh, for both the depreciation to kind of true it up uh, to the combined consolidated amount, and then another and uh, another entry realizing that intercompany uh, permit that um, sale to uh, an outside party. All right, let's look at an example. Peru owns eighty percent of Santiago's outstanding shares. So Peru is Santiago's parent. On December 31st of year five, Santiago sold land and a building to Peru Corp for total proceeds of $2.5 million. 60% of the selling price was allocated to the land with the remainder allocated to the building. The land had originally cost Santiago $1.6 million. And on December 31st, year five, the building had a net book value of 800,000 with the remaining useful life of 25 years. What is the impact to the year eight financial statements? Okay, so please keep in mind that you will still need to make a separate adjustment to the opening retained earnings to eliminate the intercompany gain at the beginning of the year. That is not what I'll be doing here because I wanna focus on what is the impact during um, the year eight financial statements. So here, if we look at what's been happening, let's first split 
and the items between the depreciable asset, the building, and the land, the non-depreciable asset, because as you've just seen the last couple of videos, they're quite different. Okay, so now we have what we've allocated the purchase, pardon me, yes, well, the purchase or selling price to, 60% um, to the land and the remainder to the building. And then we have the net book value at the time of the sale of the land, uh, as well as the, pardon me, of the building and the land. Okay, so now we have essentially that we have a $200,000 intercompany gain for the building and a $100,000 um, loss on the sale for the land. And again, both of those um, will be impacting to our opening retained earnings as well, because we've had a couple of years go by, our intercompany gain on the building, remember, needs to be depreciated over the useful life. So we have 200,000 divided by 25 equals we're permitted to realize 8,000 of this gain each year because essentially on the on um, Peru Corp's books, they are going to be depreciating too high. They're going to be depreciating um, based off of this um, one million dollars. So their depreciation is going to be too high. How much too high? Well, 20, 200,000 divided by 25 equals 8,000 per year. And there's been two years, that is one for year six and one for year seven to get us to the beginning of year eight. We didn't do anything in year five because they sold it. The transaction occurred at the end of the year. So no depreciation for no days in the year. And yeah, then we get up to unrealized at the end of year seven, which really doesn't matter because all we're looking at is what the heck do you need to do in this year? And we have another 8,000 because again, this is this profit needs to be realized the same way of depreciation, which is straight line over 25 years. Okay, so what I wanna bring to your attention is that we need to, um, in order to realize this gain, realize this $8,000 in this year, we need to decrease. So we need to decrease uh, depreciation, but I want you to think about it like this. What would a gain to the income statement be? It would be a credit. So we'd want to ensure that we have a credit to the financial statement, and so, pardon me, a credit to the income statement. So we don't have, you know, gain, but rather because it's been depreciated too high on um, Peru's books, in order to realize the gain, we can just offset that too high depreciation and credit it in the same way we would credit a gain for 8,000. The offset will always be to PP&E. Okay, so a little bit weird. Absolutely. Um, and the reason, another reason why we like to track it like this at the end is because sometimes, um, you know, they might sell it at the end of the year, in which case uh, we would have the offset to depreciation and we want a separate and uh, a separate transaction um, to demonstrate the sale because this is being used by consumption and then we want to recognize the sale. Okay, let's continue this example. So on April 30th of year eight, ooh, April 30th, Peru, so in the current year, Peru sold equipment to Santiago, so downstream, for $126,000. The net book value of the equipment on Peru's books was 180,000. And on the date of the sale, the equipment had a remaining useful life of six years. What is the impact to the year eight financial statements? Well, please note that in this instance, the transaction occurred in the current year, year eight, so there are no adjustments to be made to opening retained earnings. So let's analyze this downstream transaction. We had a selling price of $126,000 and the net book value was 180, which means there's a current period loss to eliminate. Well, what, how do we eliminate that loss? Well, I want to point out that it was occurred on April 30th uh, of during the year. So we need to ensure that we reflect the fact that there's only eight out of 12 months left. So we need to prorate this. So yes, as at April 30th, 
this um, remaining useful life was exactly six years. So we take this loss that we need to, um, this unrealized loss that we need to um, adjust for, divided by six, and that gives us our 6.75 uh, 6 uh, K per year, and then times it by the eight twelfths, which gets us our $6,000. So from this current period, uh, intercompany sale, we need to first uh, reverse out the total amount of unrealized loss. So we need to make sure that we um, credit the loss on the sale of equipment because on, um, let's see, on Peru's books, because Peru sold them, they'd have a loss of 54,000. So we first need to adjust for that loss because it's in the current year, we would be hitting the loss account directly. So a loss on Peru's books would have been a debit, so therefore to eliminate it, we'd make it a credit. And the offset would be to the PP&E account. Then as we go through, we go to May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and we get to December 31st of year eight, we need to recognize the, the, um, the loss proportional to the amount of depreciation that would have been booked at a too low amount because this loss didn't really happen, but yet um, Santiago is recording the depreciation at too low of an amount. How much too low? Well, $6,000. So we need to debit that depreciation expense to increase it with our offset to PP and E. Okay, so you'll notice that both of these, example and example continued, didn't explicitly hit on NCI in here. And that is because when you are first setting up your, uh, your worksheet entries, they are to smush out the double counting, which happens uh, at the consolidated level for each account item. And so as we flow through and as we flow through the various pieces in our tutorial videos, you will see how NCI is impacted and that yes, there will be an extra step for anything related to uh, opening retained earnings as well as um, current year's net income when we're talking about um, any upstream transactions. But let's dig in this a little bit more. Um, as with land and inventory, upstream from sub to parent results in a proportional allocation of profit and depreciation adjustments uh, through consolidated net income and consolidated retained earnings. But as I mentioned, uh, that's only for upstream transactions. Why? Yes, it's because parent owns 100% of parent. All right, one question and then we are good people. Which of the following statements are true, is true? One statement is true. Is it A, downstream sales of pp and &E have no effect on consolidated net income attributable to NCI? Is it B, depreciation on pp and &E sold to a sub is recorded based on the sale amount? C, it is not possible to record a loss on an intercompany sale of pp and &E. Or D, gains on the sale of intercompany pp and &E can only be recognized by selling the asset to a third party. If you answered A, downstream sales of pp and &E have no effect on the consolidated net income attributable to NCI, you would be correct. And that is because the parent owns 100% of the parent. Uh, B is not true because depreciation on pp and &E sold to a sub should be recorded on the, on the original cost to the combined entity. C is not correct because it is possible to record a loss on an intercompany sale of pp and &E, as we saw in our example continued. And D is not correct because the gain on sale of intercompany pp and &E, uh, can be recognized by either selling the asset to a third party or by depreciating it. Okay, please. I really encourage you now um, to not rewatch the videos. If you've been taking uh, notes here and there, go straight to the tutorial questions. Go straight uh, to applying this knowledge and then circle back and beef up your no notes. Um, 
As I stated in the first video, learning is repeated exposure to same or similar materials and not cram it in. Let your brain, let your mind, let your sleep, let all of this help you along the way so that you're working smarter, not harder. As always, I'm available via email and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much.